So the liver, or the hepar in Latin, is the largest internal organ in the body. It lies on the right side of the belly and weighs approximately one and a half kilograms, so it's pretty heavy. The liver's main job is to filter the blood coming from the digestive tract before passing it to the rest of the body. And it does that through the portal system. And even though you're not familiar with the portal system yet, it's quite important to understand this concept to fully understand the anatomy of the liver. And it's quite simple. The portal system is just veins that drain the nutrition and food from the digestive tract and waste products from the spleen. And when all of those veins meet, they become the portal vein, which will go through the liver. And then the liver will filter the blood from harmful substances and then send the blood further into the systemic circulation through the inferior vena cava. Now, this is a very simplified scheme of the portal system, but I hope you get what I tried to tell you earlier, that it filters the blood coming from the digestive tract. The liver also detoxifies the body by transforming potential harmful substances, such as drugs and alcohol, into harmless products to be eliminated in the bile or urine. It also produces cholesterol, which is used for the production of certain hormones and vitamin D. Many nutritions are stored in the liver as well, including certain fats and glycogen. And this glycogen can be used in case of a low blood sugar, for example. So it has many functions. Now, as always, looking at the anatomy of an organ, I like to start with the topography to have the orientations in our head. If we add the lines and look at the holotopy, meaning the liver's position in relation to the body as a whole, the liver actually covers the whole upper level of the abdominal cavity within the ribs. You will find it in the right hypochondriac region, the epigastric region, and then you will find it extending to the left hypochondriac region. From a clinical perspective, we visualize the borders of the liver by using the skeletopy of the liver, meaning its position in relation to our bones. As you see here, the superior border starts at the level of the 10th rib, and then extends up to the level of the fourth intercostal space at the region of approximately the right midclavicular line. And then it goes to the fifth intercostal space, left of the sternum. And then it ends at the sixth intercostal space. So that's the superior border. The inferior border is here. It also starts at the tenth rib at the right side and goes up to the level of the eighth and ninth rib. And then it continues all the way up to the sixth intercostal space on the left side where it ends. And then posteriorly, you will find it between the ninth thoracic vertebrae to the eleventh thoracic vertebrae. So that is the skeletopy of the liver. Now let's do the syntopy of the liver, meaning its position in relation to other organs. Let's look at the superior border first. This is the surface we call the diaphragmatic surface, because you will find this perfectly drawn diaphragm resting on it, as you see here. And then the inferior border, we call this the visceral surface, meaning the surface that faces different organs. So let's go ahead and zoom in. You will find the pillars of the stomach lying very close to the visceral surface of the liver, but you will also find the upper part of the duodenum, you will find the colon, you will find the right kidney, and you will also find the esophagus and the stomach, the upper part of the stomach lying very close to the superior end of the liver as well. So that was it for the topography. Now, let's continue with the external surface of the liver. And we're going to start by looking at the liver from an anterior view. The first thing that catches your eyes is a distinct ligament on the middle called the falciform ligament. And this ligament separates the right and the left lobe. Now the liver has two margins, right? You have the inferior margin projecting downwards. And this margin is very sharp in shape. And now let's change the angle and look at the liver posteriorly you will find this rounded posterior margin, which is not as sharp as the inferior one. But an interesting thing about the posterior margin is that the whole liver is covered by ligaments and fat, which we call the peritoneum, except for this area right here on the posterior margin. We call this area the bare area or area nuda. It's bare because it's the only place that is not covered by fat tissue. It's in direct contact with the diaphragm, because remember, the diaphragm lies on top of the liver. So now that we are looking at the liver posteriorly, let's go ahead and look at its distinct features back here. We have three important grooves on the posterior surface. The first one is the right sagittal groove. And the right sagittal groove is formed by two other grooves you will find on the, on the visceral surface of the liver. 
And here I want you to imagine the inferior vena cava running in this direction, forming the groove for the inferior vena cava, right? So the right sagittal groove goes like that. It is formed by the fossa for the gallbladder down here, and it's also formed by the fossa for the inferior vena cava. So that's the right sagittal groove. It separates the right lobe from all other lobes you will find on the posterior view of the liver. And then we have the left sagittal groove. And to understand this groove, we need to know the ligaments. So down here, we have a ligament called the round ligament of the liver, or ligamentum teres hepatis in Latin. And above that, there's a ligament called the venous ligament of the liver, or ligamentum venosum. And these two ligaments form the left sagittal groove, which separates the left lobe from the rest of the lobes. And then finally, we can see one more groove called the transverse groove, which is also known as the porta hepatis. Now the porta hepatis is a short depression through which all the neurovascular structures and the hepatic ducts enter or leave the liver. And we will talk more about the porta hepatis in a minute, but let's finish looking at the landmarks on the liver first. So the transverse groove goes like this and separates the caudate lobe from the quadrate lobe. Now we have four lobes on the posterior side and two lobes on the anterior side, right? This is what we call an anatomical classification or division of the liver, dividing it into lobes. And don't confuse it with something called the Cunard system, which divide the liver into eight functionally independent segments, where each segment has its own vascular inflow and outflow and biliary drainage. Knowing this makes it easier to surgically operate segments of the liver away. So keep in mind that we have a classification system based on the landmarks we have on the liver, and a classification system that divides the liver into functionally independent segments. So that's the division of the liver. Now, let's talk a little bit more about the porta hepatis, which I've highlighted in green right here. As we said earlier, the porta hepatis, or the transverse groove, is a short, deep depression. And there are a few things that go in and out from this place. The most noticeable structure is the common hepatic duct. But you will also find the hepatic portal vein, and the hepatic artery proper going into the liver through the transverse groove as well. Other structures you'll find here are the hepatic lymph nodes and some nerves called the hepatic plexi uh, going through the transverse grooves as well. And they're all covered by the hepatoduodenal ligament. And this is a ligament that starts off at the liver and goes down to the duodenum. Therefore, it's called the hepatoduodenal ligament because it attaches the liver to the duodenum. Now let's go over and look at the coverings of the liver. So the liver is protected, right? It's protected by something called tunica fibrosa, which is a fibrous sheath. And then on top of it, it's covered by something we call the peritoneum. And I'll talk more about the peritoneum in a separate video. But for now, imagine, this is a sagittal plane of the abdominal cavity, right? Now for orientation's sake, this is the liver, the stomach, the transverse colon, the small intestine, and down here is a sigmoid colon. Now this is a woman's abdominal cavity, so the uterus is here. Now we have something called the peritoneum, and essentially what that is, is that it's a layer of fat that is distributed around the abdominal cavity, and we divide it into two parts. We have the parietal peritoneum in green, which covers the surrounding walls of the abdominal cavity, and then we have the visceral peritoneum, which covers the organs inside of the abdominal cavity here in blue. So not only is the liver covered by the tunica fibrosa, the fibrous layer, but it's also covered by the visceral peritoneum, also called the tunica serosa, because the peritoneum forms a serous membrane which reduces the friction to surrounding structures. That's why it's very good to have the visceral peritoneum covering the liver. But the whole liver is not covered. There's actually a place called the bare area. Remember we mentioned this earlier? The bare area which is in direct contact with the diaphragm? So that's the coverings of the liver. To understand the anatomy of the liver fully, you now only need to know the ligaments that connect the liver to the diaphragm up here and the ligaments that connect the liver to other organs. So let's look at the ligaments around the liver in a little more detail. The ligaments from the liver to the diaphragm are three or four, because the last one has a right and a left ligament. Then there are four ligaments connecting the liver to other organs. So let's look at the ligaments towards the diaphragm first. The first ligament is this one highlighted in green, called the falciform ligament. This ligament connects the liver to the anterior abdominal wall. And then if you remove the diaphragm, 
we will see two distinct ligaments on either side connected to the falciform ligament in the middle called the coronary ligament. This ligament connects the liver to the diaphragm. And then again, don't forget that we have a bare area or area nuda here in the middle. So you will see the coronary ligament surrounding the bare area. So if you look at the liver posteriorly, we'll be able to properly see the coronary ligament surrounding the bare area. All right, so now we have two more ligaments we can see on this model. And these are the triangular ligaments. We have the left triangular ligament and the right triangular ligament. They kind of resemble a triangle as you see here. So that was all the ligaments towards the diaphragm. Now let's go over and look at the ligaments that go from the liver towards other organs. These are four ligaments and they all start from porta hepatis. So I want you to keep in mind that they all start from porta hepatis. So the first one is the hepatogastric ligament. And as the name says, it goes from the liver to the stomach. Or in Latin, it goes from the hepar to the gustid. That's why it gets the name ligamentum hepatogastricum. And then the next one is the hepatoduodenal ligament, going from the porta hepatis of the liver to the duodenum. And remember, as we saw earlier, this ligament contains the bile duct, veins, nerves, arteries, and things going in and out from the porta hepatis. So that was the hepatoduodenal ligament. Next, we have the hepatorenal ligament. Renal means kidneys. So this one goes from the liver to the right kidney. And the right kidney is behind here, so it goes like this. Some sources might not mention this ligament, as they consider it a part of the coronary ligament I mentioned earlier. And some sources might do, so keep that in mind. And then lastly, we have the round ligament of the liver, or ligamentum teres hepatis. This one projects anteriorly and extends from the porta hepatis towards the umbilical ring, or the navel, because it is the remnant of the left umbilical vein during fetal life. 